Deliver the crew of Shuttle Mission 5 did. Only eight hours into the first operational flight of the Space Shuttle program. Fifth flight of the orbiter Columbia. The first four missions were test flights to prove the space transportation system could provide access to low Earth orbit on a routine basis. Those missions laid the groundwork for the... Roger, Brian, we got to that. Thank you very much. Welcome forward to having a good one. Roger, and good luck. landing only minutes after sunrise at Edwards Air Force Base California ended Columbia's fifth mission looking slightly weathered the orbiter had traveled over ten and a half million miles in five flights spent 24 days on orbit and circled the earth almost 400 times it would now return to Kennedy Space Center Florida for refurbishment to be launched again on shuttle flight 9 The newest orbiter in NASA's fleet, Challenger, would fly on Shuttle Flight 6. Many weight-saving improvements had been made. The orbiter itself was almost 2,500 pounds lighter because of structural changes. The external tank weighed 10,000 pounds less than the one used on Shuttle Flight 1. The solid rocket boosters were almost 4,000 pounds lighter. The three main engines were upgraded to 104% of rated thrust. A blanket-like thermal material replaced 600 thermal tiles in non-critical areas. And all 30,000 tiles were densified to improve their durability. This stack could carry over 17,000 pounds more into orbit than Columbia. Minus 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, we will go for main engine ignition. Seven, six, we have main engine ignition. Yeah, I guess I'm not worried about a whole program. This is 
yourself. On Shuttle Flight 6, Challenger's cargo, the tracking and data relay satellite, Tigris, and its solid propellant inertial upper stage rocket, the IUS, weighed almost 19 tons. Tigris was the largest, most advanced communication satellite launched to date. That is correct. A major accomplishment in space communications. Tigris is launched from the payload bay by ejection springs released when explosive bolts are fired. After shuttle moves a safe distance away, the first stage of the IUS rocket fires to boost the satellite from 150 miles to 22,300 miles in altitude. Then the first stage separates. Shortly thereafter, the second stage of the IUS rocket fires to circularize the satellite's orbit. Solar panels and antennas are deployed to provide power and tracking and data relay capability. Having attained a circularized altitude of 22,300 miles and traveling at the same speed as the Earth's rotation, the satellite will remain fixed in orbit over the same location continuously. Later, the first Tedris will be joined by two more identical satellites. The three will form a space communications network, providing almost continuous coverage to Earth orbiting spacecraft, not the 15% ground stations provide. The network will be able to track 26 Earth orbiting spacecraft simultaneously. And because Tedris satellites only relay data, they do not process it. 20 times more information will be handled by this network than could be by ground stations. All data will be relayed directly to the primary NASA ground terminal, White Sands, New Mexico, and from there via domestic satellite to other NASA centers. of Tedris was on time and minor. First stage firing of the inertial upper stage also went well. And Sunnyvale and White Sand sent you a special attaboy. However, halfway through the second stage firing, ground controllers lost communication with the satellite. It was an hour before even intermittent signals were picked up. They indicated Tedris had not yet separated from the IUS and that both were tumbling at a very high rate of speed. Receiving only intermittent signals from Tedris, using short-life batteries which would soon be depleted, and getting no response to signals sent from the ground, made the outlook for Tedris bleak. Several more hours passed, and then something remarkable happened. Experts still aren't sure why, but either an automatic timing mechanism was engaged, or onboard systems finally acknowledged repeated commands from the ground, separating Tedris from the IUS. I do have some uh, words. Now on its own, the satellite stopped tumbling. Ground controllers commanded deployment of the solar array and antennas. However, they quickly learned Tedris was way off course and drifting farther every day. Their only hope of getting it back on course was to use the tiny hydrazine thrusters originally designed for minor attitude and velocity adjustments, not for boosting the two-and-a-half ton Tedris over 8,500 miles farther into space. But at least the satellite was not lost. NASA officials immediately put their plan into effect. Meanwhile, Shuttle Flight 6 continued as planned. Okay, we're back with you, Milo, uh, for about 12 more minutes. We've got a good TV picture again. Roger, Houston. Roger, Houston. Roger, Houston. Roger, Houston. Roger, Houston. Roger, Houston.
This was America's first spacewalk in nine years. The astronauts were attached by safety tethers to slag wires running just inside the payload bay. They wore a new design in spacesuits, also called extravehicular mobility units. A portable life support system was worn on the back, eliminating the need for a lifeline connected to the orbiter. These suits are not custom built for each astronaut. Tops and bottoms of different sizes can be mixed. They are also more flexible than previous spacesuits. The crew removed tools from a storage locker in the front part of the payload bay. Then moved aft again. Using a cable run through a winch mounted on the bulkhead, then tied to the cradle that had held the IUS, the astronauts demonstrated they could have lowered the cradle manually had commands from on board failed. Winch operations were tested on the front bulkhead using an exergenie as a load to see how many pounds the winch and line could handle. Lastly, the tools were re -stowed. And the astronauts re-entered the spacecraft. Perhaps the most visually spectacular mission since America's first landing on the moon, Shuttle Flight 7 gave us our first glimpse of the orbiter from a distance. The magnificent views were provided by a European payload called SPAS. SPAS is an acronym for Shuttle Pallet Satellite, a unique reusable space platform built by the West German aerospace company Messerschmitt Balkov Blom, with generous financial assistance from the West German Federal Ministry of Research and Technology. In addition to having American television and film cameras mounted on spas, 10 experiments belonging to the West German government, the European Space Agency, and NASA were on the platform. MBB wanted to validate the satellite's design and prove experiments could be operated while spas was free flying. 